Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the last day of Sabbath School Study Group for this week, lesson number eight, looking at the life of Jesus, Jesus in the writings of Peter. And I'm so glad that we've made it. God is good. It's the day of preparation for the Sabbath and for the weekend to start our rest and our time with him. You know, God is good because on our end, this is the last day of school for many of the people in our area. And we're trusting that today is the day that um, a lot of people will wrap up this season and begin the new one. That's what God is all about. He's about seasons. He's about movement and change in our lives. And so hopefully this week has been a study that's allowed you to enter into a new season by looking at Jesus in a new way. What we're going to do this morning as we wrap up this week is we're going to focus on Jesus in the writings of Peter, but specifically we're going to look at Jesus as our sacrifice. Jesus as the only one who was qualified to both be the sacrifice and then to minister the sacrifice, as the Bible calls him, our priest, our high priest. And so today, as we look at this aspect of Christ, I hope that it touches our hearts to see all that God gave up for us and all that he wants to give us because of what he's given up. So let's pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, now we pray. Speak to our hearts, Father. And Jesus, may we see you as you truly are, the lamb that was slain for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's get to it. Today is our memory text in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. I don't think I'm going to say today again because I know today is today. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Here's what it says. It says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. The glory of salvation is in this verse. And we realize that, whoa, we, we, we're now, we're, we should be dead to sin, but alive unto God, living in righteousness. Where's this power coming from? This is the power, but, but what's the source? How are we able to legally, as, as guilty before God, say, I can live and live in righteousness, live in victory. It's all paid for. It's all signed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it says in that last part of the verse, by whose stripes we are healed. Those stripes, the suffering, the sacrifice, that's what's afforded us the chance to be free. And that's why we always say salvation is free to us, but it costs Jesus everything. And that's why we worship him. Because when we look at our wake up word this morning, the words that should inspire us and revive us for this day, all of them almost come from the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Because it's in Leviticus or the book of the Levites that we see the sacrificial system is laid out, not by Moses, but he received this instruction as he was given the pattern and given the system by God to put into the mind of Israel what it would mean and how they would stay free and how they would be free through Jesus, the Messiah to come. And so when you look at those lessons, the lessons are eternal. We no longer have to practice them, praise God. But the lessons, they are here and they're there for us to understand what they did in that sanctuary. And with that lamb is what the father had to do with his son to save you and me. So that's why we're going to go back to look forward. So as we think about our big three today, the big three, the first point is this, the depth of our state of being lost can be seen in the depth of what God lost. The depth of our state of lostness can be understood by seeing the depth of God's lostness. What did he give up? And that shows you how far down he had to go to get us out of this hole. Well, looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we were redeemed and the word corruptible. It's not so much uh, speaking in terms of moral value, but it's talking about in terms of its intrinsic value. How long does it last? Or, or where its source is. So gold and silver, it's worldly and, and it doesn't last forever. It, it doesn't glitter always. 
So we were not bought with, with that kind of currency, even though it's, it's the best standard currency instead of this paper money that we call money. But here we see that we were made redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And so we see the depth of our lostness, the depth of our condition by what it cost or what God had to give up to get us back. And it literally took spilled blood to atone for the blood or the law that we have violated. Because when we look at what God went through and we look at what Jesus went through, it helps us to see that we were way down in the bottom of the well, not just a well. And this is a picture of a sinkhole in a city in Peru. And the thing that's so that's so intrig intriguing about this picture is that you see how, how big that sinkhole is. And you have that that sandstone under the, the uh, con uh, not concrete, but pavement. And you see how it just whittled away and, and it decayed and, and left that huge cavern. Look in the back at the rescue or, or the emergency workers. They're not doing anything. There's nothing that they can do. They see the hole, they see the problem, but there is nothing that anyone can do. That was our situation. There was nothing that could be done about getting us out of this hole. We were in that hole. We were lost in sins, the Bible says. The Bible says that we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We were, we were broken, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. But Jesus said, I will give my blood. And the Father said, I will accept that as the atonement so that they will know how holy and righteous I am and how serious I am about us being one as a family. But then also, because I love my family so much, this is what I'm willing to give up, my only begotten son. Jesus said, this is what I'm willing to give up. My, my, my throne, my, my position as, as the son of God, I'll give it all up. I'll leave heaven for Chris because he said, I would rather you be in heaven without me than, than, than I be in heaven without you. That's love. That's the hole that Jesus got us out of. Point number two today is that the sacrifice, that's Jesus, capital sacrifice, wants to separate us from that which separates us from him. And that's sin. What put Jesus in the hole? What put us in the hole? Sin. So it's natural for the loving God and his son to hate the thing that put us in this hole, the thing that put his son, the thing that put Jesus in this hole, and that's sin, as it truly is. So to help us see, well, well how can I get, the Lord had this problem, how can I help them to hate something that now becomes natural to them? Oh, I'm going to use allegorical processes called the, the sanctuary service and the sacrificial system so they can see the separation that I need from sin and sinners. Because I'm coming to destroy sin, but I've also come at the same time to save sinners. See, in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 8, in the system, it says, He, the high priest or the priest, shall take off from it all of the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. See, the fat in the sacrificial service symbolizes sin. And so they were, that was totally removed from the meat or the flesh of the animal. In Leviticus 4.19, it says, And he shall take all his fat from him and burn it upon the altar. So it's amazing. And if you recognize, if you've ever seen fat burn when you've been cooking meat, that fat, it gristles. But fat also use, is, is used in, in a lot of places as a source of fuel. It burns and it burns bright. And it kind of flares up. And so it's amazing how this is the fat that was supposed to be separated, then burnt. And that bright light, that flare was to show how God's grace, his righteousness, it's to consume the fat. It's to burn up our sin. It's to atone for it and then give us the victory over it. Because there's no sin that can be atoned for that cannot be overcome. Because if it could not be overcome in us, then it could not be consumed by the fire of God's grace and his righteousness. And so that's why we see even victory being illustrated 
in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. In Leviticus 4.31, it says, And he, the priest, shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. The glory of this whole service is that it shows how God forgives us of our sins. But that forgiveness, it comes through atonement. It comes through a payment that's not ours, but it's through the blood and through the offering of the, of the, of the lamb. And when you look at it, it says he will take away all the fat thereof. God wants to have a total intimate relationship with us because that's the only way we can have peace. Peace in our lives. It's the fruit of of an entire surrender, giving all of, if, if you would, putting all of our issues, taking all the baggage and giving it to him saying, Lord, you pay for this. You, you, you got it. And the Bible says when the person is willing to give it away, God is willing to forgive it. All of it. All of it. Amen. Leviticus 4.35 says, and he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace of the priest's offerings. Oh, I think I'm repeating the verse. Let me see if I can go to Leviticus chapter 4, verse 35 in the sword right here. Looking in the Bible in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 35. Leviticus 4, verse 35. No, it's actually, man, it's actually, it's it's Leviticus, that's Leviticus 4, verse 35. Oh, it's repeating. Hmm. So it's repeating. It must be important then that it would almost be a direct copy of verse 31. Because again, it's not so much the Lord being meticulous about his instructions that they follow them. He's being meticulous about the lesson being learned that we see. I want to take away all of your issues. I want to take away all of your drama because I want us to be at peace with each other. I and I'm willing. Mm. What's the last part of verse 35? And it shall be forgiven him. That's the glory of God's grace. This is what the lamb accomplishes. This is what Jesus as our sacrifice is able to do. Jesus in us is able to separate us from our sin. He's able to cut the fat, if you would, as you see in the picture, because I don't eat meat. And so I'm not familiar with doing that myself. But I know that whether you are a meat eater, a vegetarian, vegan, a lacto oval, whatever, how you roll in your diet, only one person, only one butcher, only one high priest, Hebrew says, is worthy and able to separate us from the things that bring us down, from the hole that we are in. And that's Christ in his righteousness. The Bible says not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, by the working of God in our lives, we're able to grow in his grace and to make our whole the past, to make our drama the past. And that past then turns into a testimony to testify to what God can do, how we can become more like him and less like this world. This is all because of his stripes. We are healed. When we go to point number three, it's simply this. The salvation of the sacrifice is for all. Now, remember the sacrifice, the separating of the, the, the flesh from the fat. All of this took place on an altar. Check it. Leviticus chapter four, verse seven. It says, and the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar. Now, remember all the way in first Peter, we saw that by his blood, we are healed. We're brought up out of that deep, dark hole. Well, the Lord instructed the priest to then take that blood and put it upon the the altar horns and it will be a sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall pour all of the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Look at verse four, verse 18 of chapter four. He shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord. That's in the tabernacle of the congregation and shall pour out all of the blood at the bottom of the altar. Of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Hmm. Look again, Leviticus 4.25. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger 
and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering. Do you see the repetition? Even for the varying offerings, for the different types of offering. And we see here in verse 30, the priest shall take the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. Why are these things being repeated even within the same chapter? One, because of the varied offerings, but also two, because of repetition. He is trying to press a point on Israel, trying to press a point on us today. Verse 34, the priest was supposed to do it with his finger, his writing instrument, the finger. There's a connection, a direct connection between the priest and that blood because it wasn't an extension. It was supposed to be a part, but it shows how Jesus himself would offer this blood. And it shows that he would put it symbolically the priest on the horns of the altar now here's the situation the horns of the altar and here's a model of how that altar looked this altar would be there and it would be the first thing that you would see when you entered the sanctuary that's why in the previous verse it said at the door of the congregation and there were different places sections within the sanctuary some that were open to the public others that were not and this altar would be the first that you would see. And behind that altar, there would be a laver or a big old tub or basin full of water. And then beyond that would be the physical sanctuary where you would have the holy place and the most holy place that only the priest could enter and only at certain times. But this altar, as people came and went in and out, the public would see and it was available in what was called the outer court. And when you saw this altar, you'd see those four horns. And the thing that's so beautiful about the horns, was that for protection? Was it for um, security? Nobody would touch the, oh, no, 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 no. What it shows is, is everything that happens in the center of this altar, the sacrifice and it being consumed in fire and the sweet savor before God, that symbology is supposed to go out into all the world. Those four corners represent the four corners of direction to the north, to the south, to the east and the west, the Lord has extended and he's offering this sacrifice to everybody and everybody always includes me. Don't forget that. Everybody always includes me. So this atonement, this forgiveness, this grace is for everyone. It was not just for Israel. It was not just for those who were chosen of God. God chose everyone for the salvation of the world. He just chose a family. He chose a person to share that salvation, but they got caught up and thought that that salvation was for them. They forgot that the blood was put on all four horns. The blood is for all of us. That's why when it says in John 3, 16, God so loves the world that he gave and Christ has given to all of us. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what faith you belong to, what faith you don't belong to, what you have or what you don't have. We all have a savior. His name is Jesus. The difference, what separates us is not do we have a savior, it's who chooses to be saved, who chooses to accept what Christ did for him. Well, let's look at our question of the day. With all of this, all for us, the question that we have to ask ourselves, what is the fact that our hope of salvation exists only in a substitute punished in our place teach us about our utter dependence upon God? We can only be saved by a substitute. We can only be saved by someone who was punished in our place. What does that say about the love of God towards us? Well, Christ's Object Lessons, as we wrap up this week on page 157, it says Christ has pledged himself to be our substitute and surety. If you're doubting this morning, if you're afraid, if you're worried about your status, if, if you know, Lord, I've done wrong, I'm in wrong, is there hope for me? What can you do? He neglects no one. He who could not see human beings exposed to eternal ruin without pouring out his soul unto death in their behalf, will look with pity and compassion upon every soul who realizes that he cannot save himself. When we realize that we are stuck like Chuck, as we used to say growing up, that's when you receive the grace. That's when you're able, if you turn to Jesus, to know that he will look upon no trembling suppliant without raising him up. 
He who through his own atonement provided for man an infinite fund, an infinite fund of moral power, will not fail <laughs> to employ this power in our behalf. We may take our sins and sorrows to his feet, for he loves us. His every look and word invites our confidence. He will shape and mold our characters according to his own will. Accept it in a moment and changed for a lifetime. Redeemed in an instant and then reformed for a lifetime. This is the gift that he gives us. Come, I'll take all of it away. And then I will walk with you day by day to live out and to become what I've already given you. Perfect in Jesus Christ. That's the story of salvation. And today we want to pray that it's the testimony of us, the saved. Lord Jesus, be with us now. And if this is the promise, we claim it. And we don't want to live our way anymore. Jesus, we have messed up. We have forsaken you. But thank you. You have forgiven us. And today, may we live out this salvation so that other people will see that they too can be free in you. Thank you, God, that you are so good to us. May we not think, Lord, that we are better sinners than you are a Savior. We receive you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. What a day, what a lesson, what a week. And we hope that you've been encouraged because next week, the lesson's entitled, Be Who You Are. Whose are we? We've been redeemed, and it's time for us to be that way. And so we want to rejoice in that next week. Be with us. Please like this, share this, follow us, subscribe, get the word out, because everybody used to know all four corners of the world. We need to let the world know Jesus saves. God bless you. And until next time, let's remember that change is good. <laughs>